stand and face Jerusalem. Our Father which art in heaven. Our Father which art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth. Thy will be done in earth. As it is in heaven. As it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts. And forgive us our debts. As we forgive our debtors. As we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. For thine is the kingdom. And the power. And the power. And the glory. And the glory. Forever. Forever. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. For he is good. For he is good. For his mercy endureth forever. For his mercy endureth forever. Praise the Lord God of Israel. Praise the Lord God of Israel. For he is good. For he is good. For his mercy endureth forever. For his mercy endureth forever. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Today's scripture reading comes from Psalms chapter 89, verses 28-33. My mercy will I keep for him forevermore, and my covenant shall stand fast with him. His seed also will I make to endure forever, and his throne have the days of heaven. If his children forsake my law, and walk not in my judgments, if they break my statutes and keep not my commandments, then will I visit their transgression with the rod, and their iniquity with stripes. Nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him, nor suffer my faithfulness to fail. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.
would be just like this. You wouldn't have no divorces. You wouldn't have no men marrying men, women marrying women. You wouldn't have none of that foolishness if everybody cared to the commandments of God. So 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1, read. Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances. So now, Paul is telling them, look, if you're going to follow me just like I follow Christ, I'm not telling you anything out of the ordinary. I praise you, brother, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. So Paul is, he gave them instructions on how to conduct themselves. And I always say, if you're going to lay the rules down, somebody got to enforce them. You just can't put a sheet on the wall with the rules. And when they get broken, don't nobody say nothing. Because when I found out when it comes to Israel, you got to put your foot on their neck. If you don't, they will run you over. So if somebody's breaking the rules, hey, point it out to them. Let them know. So read verse 2. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man. And the head of Christ is God. So that's the order of things, okay? The head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. The head of the man is Christ, and the head of Christ is God. That's the order. And it's pretty basic. That's how the Lord has to set up. And if, it's, if you got a man of God, and there's a virtuous woman, hey, everybody knows they wrong. You may have whatever marital issues you have, but everybody knows what the role is when it comes to relationships. Man and God will have no problem ruling this house righteously. That's the way it's supposed to be done. And if you don't happen to have a husband or a wife, hey, then Christ is your head. You should be able to conduct yourself accordingly in that matter. Ephesians 5. Let's look at it again. Ephesians 5. So we start in the house first, taking care of the Lord's business in the house. Then we're going to get to the clay. Ephesians 5 and verse 23. 5 and 23, read. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. So you've got to have Christ in your life, first and foremost. Because if you don't have God in your life, guess what? You're walking dead, pretty much. You have nothing to base your conduct on. You're going with the world thinks. Go ahead. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. So just like the church is subject unto Christ, then let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. Go ahead. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Okay, so we're saying the church, you know the church is none other than the people, okay? It's not the building. This is a place where we have our holy gathering, but we as a people are the ones that make up the church. So now, it says, look, husbands love their wives just like Christ loved the church and gave himself for them, that he might sanctify it and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. So we are supposed to be on one accord. Why? Because we all have the word of God with us. And it washes us up. It cleans our mind up so we can start walking correctly, conducting ourselves as servants of God. We have to. Because the Bible says... I think it's in Timothy, it says, the law wasn't made for the righteous. It was made for the sinner. So we know the person that's righteous. Why? Because he's conducting himself according to the law. <coughs> the sinner's doing whatever they want to do. They're not under the law. So let's go to uh, 2 Kings 22. Because the Lord has specific instructions on how he wants you to conduct yourself. And all you have to do is adhere to it, and you'll be all right. It's really that simple. Just take care of the Lord's business. Be 
be an example, like Paul says to Timothy, be an example to the believers. Second Kings 22. We we'll start at verse one. Second Kings 22 and verse one. Go ahead. Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned thirty and one years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Jediah, the daughter of Adiah of Boscath. So now this guy was eight years old. When he was eighteen. I'll show you that when he began to reign, and he reigned thirty-one years. What did he do? Verse two. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, and walked in all the way of David his father, turned not aside to the right hand or to the left. And he, he did that was right in the sight of the Lord. In other words, he took care of the Lord's business, okay? He set the example. He was a good king. Because we know Israel had good kings. They had bad kings, good kings, bad kings, so on and so on. But the good kings are the ones that set the example. They did which was right in the sight of the Lord. And as long as they were ruled, got a good ruler, guess what? The people will be happy. We're going to show you everything is in order when you have a good king. Keep reading. And it came to pass in the 18th year of King Josiah that the king sent Shaphan, the son of Azaliah, the son of Meshua, the scribe, to the house of the Lord, saying, Go up to Hil Hilkiah the high priest, that he may sum the silver which is brought into the house of the Lord which the keepers of the door have gathered of the people. So now Josiah said, look, go on and count the money. We got a, the Lord's house has been in disarray and it needs to be fixed. So go on up there and count the money. Go ahead. And let them deliver it into the hand of the doers of the work that have the oversight of the house of the Lord. And let them give it to the doers of the work which is in the house of the Lord to repair the breaches of the house unto carpenters and builders and masons and to buy timber and hewn stone to repair the house. Now how the Lord's house got neglected? Real simple. You had a bad king. And all the bad kings was caught up in what? Idolatry. So if you worship in another God, guess what? The Lord's house is being neglected. And it's falling apart. So now Josiah said, look, give this, give this money to the carpenters, to the masons, so they can take care of this business and the Lord's house. Go ahead. Howbeit, there was no reckoning made with them of the money that was delivered into their hand, because they dealt faithful. So they didn't worry about, you know, count the money. You need this bone take. They trusted these guys. They trusted them to take care of the business. So they gave them the money, and they took care of the business. They went to buy whatever they needed to have the business at hand. Keep reading. And Hilkiah, the high priest, said unto Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan, and he read it. So when they were doing the repairs, guess what? Good Lord showed up. It was always been there. But they just would never in there to read. Keep reading. And Shaphan the scribe came to the king and brought the king word again and said, Thy servants have gathered the money that was found in the house and have delivered it into the hand of them that do the work, that have the oversight of the house of the Lord. And Shaphan the scribe sheweth the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest hath delivered me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. And it came to pass, when the king had heard the words of the book of the law, that he rent his clothes. So now when he read the book of the law, and he read it, he got humbled real quick. You know why? Because they knew they was messing up. Idolatry was running rampant. And when they read it, they know how the Lord feels about it. So they knew some drama was about to take place. And we ain't going to read all of it because that's a typo. I don't want to go to verse 11. But let's flip over to 2 Kings 23. You can read the rest of it on your own. But it was, they read that, hey, the Lord was going to bring evil on the city. But let's read 2 Kings 23. So once he read the book, he read his clothes, humbled himself, got word of what was going to take place with the prophecy. And now it's time to take care of the business. 23 and 1 read. And the king sent, and they gathered unto him all the elders of Judah and, and of Jerusalem. And the king went up into the house of the Lord, and all the men of Judah, and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem with him, and the priests, and the prophets, and all the people, both small and great. And he read in their ears all the words of the book of the covenant which was found in the house of the Lord. And the king stood by a pillar, and made a covenant before the Lord, 
to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all their heart and all their soul to perform the words of this covenant that were written in this book. And all the people stood to the covenant. So now he read the book of the covenant to all the priests, the prophets, all the people, small and great. He read the words of the book of the covenant, which they found in the house of the Lord. And they made a covenant before the Lord to do what? Walk after his commandments, his <coughs> testimonies, and his statutes with all their heart, all their soul, and to perform. Because you've got to do some action. You can't just read and don't do nothing. Car will not fix itself. You have to get down there, you got to read, okay, do this, do some that, and then you get the tools and you fix it. Same way with God. You got to read how to worship Him, and then you got to put that, what you read, into action. And that's what they did. Go ahead. Verse 4 And the king commanded Hilkiah the high priest, and the priest of the second order, and the keepers of the door, to bring forth out of the temple of the Lord all the vessels that were made for Baal, and for the grove, and for all the host of heaven. And he burned them without Jerusalem in the fields of Kidron, and carried the ashes of them unto Bethel. So you see what was going on? That's why the Lord's house was a disarray, because they had the vessels that were made for Baal, and the grove, in the Lord's house. So they took them outside of Jerusalem and burned them up. Go ahead. And he put down the idolatrous priests, whom the kings of Judah had ordained to burn incense in the high places in the cities of Judah and the places round about Jerusalem. So the wicked kings of Judah had ordained their own priests to worship Baal. So Josiah put them down. Go ahead. Them also that burn incense unto Baal, to the sun, and to the moon, and to the planets, and to all the host of heaven. So you see, when Israel gets into idolatry, we go 1,000%. Not only do we worship the statues, but hey, we go to the sun, the moon, the planets, the stars, which my Lord worship everything. Go ahead. Six. And he brought out the grove from the house of the Lord without Jerusalem unto the brook Kidron, and burned it at the brook Kidron, and stamped it small to powder, and cast the powder thereof upon the graves of the children of the people. And he break down the houses of the Sodomites that were by the house of the Lord, where the women wove hangings for the grove. So he even broke down the houses of the Sodomites, and they were what? Right by the house of the Lord. Right there. Broke them down. Go ahead. And he brought all the priests out of the cities of Judah, and defiled the high places where the priests had burned incense, from Geba to Beersheba, and break down the high places of the gates that were in the entering end of the gate of Joshua, the governor of the city, which were on a man's left hand at the gate of the city. Nevertheless, the priests of the high places came not up to the altar of the Lord in Jerusalem, but they did eat of the unleavened bread among their brethren. And he defiled Topheth, which is in the valley of, of the children of Hinnom, that no man might make his son or his daughter to pass through the fire to Molech. And he took away the horses that the kings of Judah had given to the son at the entering end of the house of the Lord, by the chamber of the Nathanelet, the chamberlain, which was in the suburbs, and burned the chariots of the sun with fire. So this man, he got a lot of sin. He taken out all kind of idolatrous worship. He taking care of the Lord's business. He is. That's what good kings do. They set the example. That's what they do, because they doing it for the Lord. They taking care of the Lord's business. Go ahead. And the altars that were on the top of the upper chamber of Ahaz which the kings of Judah had made, and the altars which Manasseh had made in the two courts of the house of the Lord, did the king beat down, and break them down from thence, and cast the dust of them into the brook Kidron, and the high places that were before Jerusalem, which were on the right hand of the Mount of Corruption, which Solomon, the king of Israel, had built it for Ashtoreth, the abomination of the Zidonians, and for Chemosh, the abomination of the Moabites, and for Milcom, the abomination of the children of the of Amon, did the king defy. So Solomon messed up when he got old and started building those churches with his, his uh, strange wives. Yes. They were still around at this time. So Josiah tore that stuff down. Go ahead. And he break in pieces the images and cut down the grove and filled their places with the bones of men. Moreover, the altar that was at Bethel 
and the high place which Jeroboam the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin, had made both that altar and the high place he break down, and burned the high place, and stamped it small to powder, and burned the grove. And as Josiah turned himself, he spied the sepulchres that were in there in the mount, and sent and took the bones out of the sepulchres, and burned them upon the altar, and polluted it, according to the word of the Lord, which the man of God proclaimed, who proclaimed these words. Then he said, What title is that that I see? And the men of the city told him, It is the sepulchre of the man of God, which came from Judah, and proclaimed these things that thou hast done against the altar of Bethel. And he said, Let him alone, let no man move his bones. So they let his bones alone, with the bones of the prophet that came out of Samaria. And all the houses also of the high places that were in the cities of Samaria, which the kings of Israel had made to provoke the Lord to anger, Josiah took away and did to them according to all the acts that he had done in Bethel. So now he even went up to Samaria. Because all the kings up there were with him. And started breaking down idolatry, idolatry over there too. Go ahead. And he slew all the priests of the high places that were there upon the altars. And burned men's bones upon them and returned to Jerusalem. So not only is he breaking stuff up and grinding it into power, guess what? He doing some killing too. Doing some killing. And killing them priests that were in the high places. And burned men's bones upon the altars. Go ahead. And the king commanded all the people, saying, Keep the Passover unto the Lord your God, as it is written in the book of this covenant. And after he did all that, he told the people, Look, keep the Passover. Remember that Passover. Go ahead. Surely there was not holding such a Passover from the days of the judges that judged Israel, nor in all the days of the kings of Israel, nor of the kings of Judah, but in the 18th year of King Josiah, wherein this Passover was holding to the Lord in Jerusalem. So now that was a, one of the greatest Passovers that ever took place, beside the first one, after Josiah had cleaned house in Jerusalem took care of the business, got rid of all the idolatry, and now people can keep the Passover with joy. What else did he do? 24, go ahead. Moreover, the workers with familiar spirits, and the wizards, and the images, and the idols, and all the abominations that were spied in the land of Judah and in Jerusalem, did Josiah put away, that he might perform the words of the law, which were written in the book that Helkiah the priest found in the house of the Lord. And like unto him was there no king before him that turned to the Lord with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his might, according to all the law of Moses. Neither after him arose there any like him. Now Josiah was a great king. Because it says, and like him, like unto him, there was no king before him that turned to the Lord with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his might. Nobody else came after him either. This was a great king. And he showed it in his actions. Because he, his action was all about taking care of the Lord's business. Which is what we have to have our mindset on. Let's go to um, Mark 11. Let's look at Jesus, what Jesus did. Mark 11. This is nothing to do. I mean, when you see people clowning up in the class, man, you can't kill them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you can only take so much, you know? Mark 11. Let's look at what Jesus did. Mark 11. Pick it up at verse 15. Yes. Mark 11, verse 15. Go ahead. And they come to Jerusalem. And Jesus went into the temple and began to cast out them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold dog doves. And what? I'm sorry, I skipped up the. Uh, no, that's the key reading. I'm sorry, go ahead. 16. And would not suffer that any man should carry any vessel through the temple. And look at the deal that, that Jesus had for the temple. Them cats in that defiled it, you know? Money changes, whatever they were selling, you know. Other scriptures will tell you Jesus wouldn't have made a quit. And went over there and beat them dudes down. I mean, you messing with somebody's 
you know, merchandise, they, they uh, livelihood, flipping over their money table, money going all over the place. You know how you're in there, it's money. They <laughs> probably grab it up, and these cats just get mad. But Jesus is thinking, go ahead, what did he say? And he taught, saying unto them, it is not written, my house shall be called of all nations the house of prayer, but ye have made it in a den of thieves. You've made it a den of thieves. They were defiling the temple. This is supposed to be a place of worship, you know? This is where we have our holy gathering. We should all be conducting ourselves in the court. That's why the Bible says what? Reverence my sanctuary. So that's the, what we should do. And Jesus did that, man. Go to first Timothy. First Timothy three. Because we had an incident a couple of weeks ago in the class in LA. You know, I had to put this dude out, man. I had to. I tried to do it light. I asked him to leave. Well, I wanted to take him outside first and talk to him. He wanted to stand his ground because he wanted an audience, you know, right. in front of everybody. I said, okay, leave. He was like, well, did you say don't come back? I said, leave and don't come back. Because you were proud. And this was going on week after week after week. The brothers were speaking into it, causing all kinds of problems. I told him, just look, if you leave this guy alone, He'll leave on his own. But as long as he's coming with that foolishness, mm -hmm. and you feed into it, he's got an audience. So when he don't want to listen to me, I have no choice. Because there's a way to deal with somebody. Right, you know, right. Take him one on one. If he don't listen, you bring another brother in. And if then he don't listen to y'all two, you put him on blast in front of the class. He just bypassed all of that. <laughs> you got to the Bible says, if you cast out the storm, guess what? Strife and contention will cease. That's right. We didn't have peace for about three weeks now until he's gone. But somebody else will come along. But now they know. Because I let it go for too long. Because I thought the brothers would handle it, but they didn't. They fed it too. So. Now they know the next time it comes along, you only get two strikes. According to Titus 3 9, after the first and admonition, first and second admonition, rejection. But now if it goes beyond two strikes, I'm going to get you, and then I'm going to put him out. You should have stopped it after two. Right. Sometimes it gets that way, but we have to maintain order in the sanctuary. Because if we don't, it's just going to cause problems. First Timothy 3 and verse 5. Read. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? And that's true. If you can't rule your own house, if you're in a position, you hold a position within the sanctuary, and your house is in disarray, ain't nobody going to listen to you up there. Nobody. Because if you can't rule your own house, how can you run this? That's why you have to set an example. If any kind of foolishness spills in to the class, guess what? It started Friday night when the sun went down. Because if it spilled over today, it never stopped. It started at last night when the Sabbath started. So what kind of example is that? You're supposed to bring no burden out of your house into the sanctuary. You're supposed to check all that foolishness at the door and leave it at home. That's why I see sisters, man, when they come up, I'm like, man, maybe I got too much zeal, but I like to see sisters with their heads covered the whole 24 hour period on a Saturday. Right. That's what I like to see. Because it's the Lord's house. How, this is a house of prayer for all people. How are you going to enter the house of prayer with your head uncovered? Right. You know, it should have been covered when the sun went down. Because it's the Lord's Sabbath. But hey, I'm the one to say something. I have to say something. That's right. Sisters come in with their head uncovered. I have a sister, sister, why your head uncovered? What was you listening to from the time you left till you got to class? You had to be listening to a lesson. Sure, 
Why all of a sudden when you come into class, your head is uncovered? That don't make no sense. But it's going to make sense when Jesus gets back. <laughs> he ain't going to play. Second Chronicles 8. Because this is not Sunday church. You know, where it's all about fashion, what you look like. Right, right. Lord can care less. It's all about the inward person. But we got to deal with Israel. Israel will have to get their head down. Show it off. <laughs> then they come in. Somebody right. say something, cover it up there. And yeah, when the lesson is over, boom, take it right off. Right. <laughs> Got to set an example. Those of us who are, uh, have a good mindset set the example. Uh, and you pass it on to the kings. That's right. Young daughters who had it here to all the time. Especially if the parents had it. You know. But I'm going too far. Let's go to second class. <laughs> First class. Second, I'm sorry. Second, they start to bring back when I did it five years ago. Anyway. Second Chronicles 8 and 1, read. And it came to pass at the end of 20 years, wherein Solomon had built the house of the Lord and his own house, that the cities which Hiram had restored to Solomon, Solomon built them and caused the children of Israel to dwell there. And Solomon went to Hamasoba and prevailed against it. And he built Tadmor in the wilderness, and all the store cities, which he built in Hamath. Also he built beth Horon, the upper, and beth Horon the nether, fenced cities with walls, gates, and bars. So now Solomon built the cities all over the place. Go ahead. And Baalath, and all the store cities that Solomon had, and all the chariot cities, and the cities of the horsemen, and all that Solomon desired to build in Jerusalem, and in Lebanon, and throughout all the land of his dominion. As for all the people that were left of the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, which were not of Israel, but of their children, who were left after them in the land, whom the children of Israel consumed not, then, then did Solomon make to pay tribute until this day. But of the children of Israel did Solomon make no servants for his work, but they were men of war, and chief of his captains, and the captains of his chariots and horses. But the children of Israel didn't make them serve. He made them men of war, captains of captains, and chariots of his horsemen. Go ahead. And these were the chief of, the, of King Solomon's officers, even 250 that bear rule over the people. So now Solomon had the chief, 250 people that bear the rule over the people. So whatever Solomon laid down, he had some people there to enforce what the king set out. And they did their job. Because Solomon was the wisest man that ever lived. And he was a good king for a long time. And the people were happy when they were under his rulership. Go ahead. And Solomon brought up the daughter of Pharaoh out of the city of David unto the house that he had built for her. For he said, My wife shall not dwell in the house of David, king of Israel, because the places are holy whereunto the ark of the Lord hath come. Then Solomon offered burnt offerings unto the Lord on the altar of the Lord, which he had built before the porch. Even after a certain rate every day, offering according to the commandment of Moses on the Sabbaths and on the new moons and on the solemn feast three times in the year, even in the feast of unleavened bread and in the feast of weeks and in the feast of tabernacles. And he appointed according to the order of David his father the courses of the priests to their servants and the Levites to their charges to praise and minister before the priests as the duty of every day required. The porters also by their courses at every gate. For so had David the man of God commanded. So now Solomon set everything in order. Everybody had their job and guess what? They was happy to do. Because they was happy to serve a good king. Verse 15, read that. And they departed not from the commandment of the king unto the priests and Levites according concerning any matter or concerning the treasures. Now all the work of Solomon was prepared unto the day of the foundation of the house of the Lord, and unto, until it was finished. 
So the house of the Lord was perfected. So the house of the Lord was perfected. Why? Because we had a wise king. He had wise servants. People that listened to him. People that did what they were supposed to do. Now when you got perfect people, then of course the house is going to be perfect. Right. Skip into chapter 9 and read that. So when somebody new come on the scene and they see everything is in order, guess what they're going to say? This is what happened. She became the south scene south. Guess what she saw? Verse 9. Chapter 9 and 1 reads. And when the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon, she came to prove Solomon with hard questions at Jerusalem, with a very great company, and camels that bear spices, and gold in abundance, and precious stones. And when she was come to Solomon, she communed with him of all that was in her heart. Solomon told her all her questions, and there was nothing hid from Solomon which he told her not. And when the queen of Sheba had seen the wisdom of Solomon, and the house that he had built, and the meat of his table, and the sitting of his servants, and the attendance of his ministers, and their apparel, his cupbearers also, and their apparel, and his ascent by which he went up into the house of the Lord, there was no more spirit in her. And she said to the king, It was a true report which I had heard in my own land of thine acts, and of thy wisdom. Howbeit I believed not their words until I came, and mine eyes had seen it. And behold, the one half of the greatness of thy wisdom was not told me, for thou exceedest the fame that I heard. Happy are thy men, and happy are these thy servants, which stand continually before thee and hear thy wisdom. So now she heard about Solomon. So when she came and saw how everything was in order, she was like, man, I ain't heard half of it. Y'all got it going on up again. Everybody's happy. People chopping up the book. Ain't nobody beat nobody down. Go ahead. Blessed be the Lord thy God, which delighted in thee to set thee on his throne, to be king for the Lord thy God. Because thy God loved Israel to establish them forever. Therefore may he be king over them to do judgment and justice. So she said, Look, blessed be the Lord your God. Which delighted me to set you on this throne. Go ahead. And she gave the king a hundred and twenty talents of gold, and of spices great abundance, and precious stones. Neither was there any such spice as the queen of Sheba gave King Solomon. So she broke them off something. No. Here, man, take this. I'm just happy to you know, ask him a question. Everybody here is happy. I got to give you an offer. But when, when somebody else comes and they see how everything is in order here, they don't break us off nothing. What they do, they keep coming. They keep coming to do what? It is true. That's why we, uh, if the example is not set, you know, we're going to run them off. They done ran a bunch of people off in LA the way they was clowning. Ran them off. Hey, the more people you have, the more problems you have. That's why you got to check it before you get started. Eventually, it will out. out. Yeah, people start growing again. But hey, you're going to have problems because we deal with this. So we have to deal with the problems as they come. But let's move on. Exodus 27. That's why you got to stay on this. Stay on. Tell them. Like I tell them in LA, y'all ain't getting me cut off. That's right. I know that's right. I ain't about to get to rock twice. <laughs> 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 my job is to serve the Lord. I'm going to act the fool if you want to. Exodus 27. So what's all about setting the example? That's all. It can be done. Now, this is what the Lord told Moses. Exodus 27. Put a line of verse in the Exodus 27, 1. Read. And thou shalt make an altar of shittim wood, five cubits long and five cubits broad. The altar shall be four square, and the height thereof shall be three cubits. And thou shalt make the horns of it upon the four corners thereof. And the Lord has given Moses instruction on how to make the altar. And it's precise. This is the Lord has said, look, this is how I want this done. Go ahead. His horn shall be of the same, and thou shalt overlay it with brass, and thou shalt make his pans to receive his ashes, and his shovels, and his basins, and his flesh hooks, and his fire pans. All the vessels thereof shalt thou 
make of brass, and thou shalt make for it a great, great a network of brass. And upon the net shalt thou make four brazen rings in the four corners thereof. And thou shalt put it under the compass of the altar beneath, that the net may be even to the midst of the altar. So now when Moses went up to the, get the commandments, he got more than the commandments. He got instructions. This was part of the instructions on how to make the altar. And it's precise, man. I'm telling you, the Lord is very precise about things that he wants done. And he laid it out how he wants us to follow him. Don't deviate to the right or the left. Just do what I say. And he had it written in every language so everybody can know. Because he scattered Israel into every, in every nation. But he made sure that whatever nation you scattered in, the word is written in your language that you know. You don't have no excuse. This Bible is written in every language. Keep reading. Verse 6. And thou shalt make staves for the altar, staves of shittim wood, and overlay them with brass. And the staves shall be put into the rings, and the staves shall be upon two sides of the altar to bear it. Hollow with boards shalt thou make it, as it was sure it be in the mount, so shall they make it. And thou shalt make the court of the tabernacle. For the south side southward there shall be hangings for the court of fine twined linen of an hundred cubits long from one side. And the twenty pillars thereof, and their twenty sockets shall be of brass. The hooks of the pillars and their fillets shall be of silver. Okay, skip down to verse 20. Because the Lord is laying out the blueprint, but guess what? Somebody got to do the work to do this. Go ahead. And thou shalt command the children of Israel that they bring thee pure oil, olive, beaten for the light, to cause the lamp to burn always. In the tabernacle of the congregation without the veil, which is before the testimony, Aaron and his sons shall order it from evening to morning before the Lord. It shall be a statute forever unto their generations on the behalf of the children of Israel. So now he told, the Lord told Moses, you're going to command the children of Israel they bring the pure oil out of the for life. Now when Israel left Egypt, guess what? Everybody was rich. Yeah. Egypt was a rich country. And the Bible says they spoiled the Egyptians. They were like, look, just get out of here. Y'all dead men if y'all ain't around. So they all had to do look. Make them shoot. They take them. Let's go. Go to Exodus 28. Pick it up at verse 1. So they had a lot of money. Everybody was rich. Go ahead. And take thou unto, unto thee Aaron thy brother, and his sons with him from among the children of Israel, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office, even Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar, Aaron's sons. And thou shalt make holy garments for Aaron thy brother for glory and for beauty. And thou shalt speak unto all that are wise-hearted, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. So now, Aaron and his sons, they had to have some certain garments, you know, to let everybody know that these are the high priests, which is where these Sunday priests get this foolishness from. They got to have these fancy suits, nice cars, big houses. Everybody got to know that, hey, I'm the man of God. But they taking this out of context. They looking to fleece the flock, get money for them. But Aaron's them holy garments, for the Lord, they were to minister him to him while they had these garments on. Verse four, be that. And these are the garments which they shall make: a breastplate and an ephod and a robe and a broidered coat and a mitre and a girdle. And they shall make holy garments for Aaron thy brother and his sons, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. So somebody had to make these garments. Somebody. And the Lord told him, "Look, you're going to speak to all those that are wise-hearted." Whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they may make these garments. So everybody don't have the same ability. Somebody has a little more than another. You know, everybody can't hit 100 miles an hour fast. You just can't hit it. Only some people can. But all those abilities, you know, they come from the Lord. But people want to, don't want to give tribute to that. They think this is all me. They got the Nebuchadnezzar says, no, no, I did all this. I went to school for 15 some years to get this degree. I did this all on my home. No. Everything comes from the Lord. 
Skip down to verse 31 and read. Go ahead. And thou shalt make the robe of the ephod all of blue, and there shall be an hole in the top of it, in the midst thereof. It shall have a binding of woven work round about the hole of it, as it were the hole of a habergum, that it, that it be not rent. And beneath upon the hem of it thou shalt make pomegranates of blue, and of purple, and of scarlet, round about the hem thereof, and the bells of gold between them round about, and golden bell and a pomegranate, a golden bell and a pomegranate upon the hem of the robe round about. And it shall be upon Aaron to minister. And his sound shall be heard when he goeth in into, unto the holy place before the Lord. And when he cometh out, that he die not. So now, then I'm, we only read this to let you know how precise the Lord is. <laughs> right. So before you, you told Aaron, before you come into the holy place, you better ring that bell, man. So I don't kill you. you, know, you just can't sneak up on the Lord, even though you can't sneak up on the Lord. Mm -hmm. He's just telling Aaron, look, ring the bell. This is what I want you to do. Don't ring that bell, guess what? I'm gonna kill you. All for what? Not ringing a bell. But that's how precise the Lord is. And they did it. Where we at? 36. Read that too. And thou shalt make a plate of pure gold and grave upon it, like the engravings of a sick holiness to the Lord. And thou shalt put it on a blue lace, that it may be upon the mitre, upon the forefront of the mitre it shall be. And it shall be upon Aaron's forehead, that Aaron may bear the iniquity of the holy things, which the children of Israel shall hollow in, hollow in all their holy gifts. And it shall be always upon his forehead, that they may be accepted before the Lord. Okay, go to um, Exodus 29. Go to a couple verses. Exodus 29. 29. Read that. And the holy garments of Aaron shall be his sons after him, to be anointed therein, and to be consecrated in them. And that son that is priest in his stead shall put them on seven days, when he cometh into the tabernacle of the congregation to minister in the holy place. Okay, so get down to 30. Now this is that which thou shalt offer upon the altar, two lambs of the first year day by day continually. Now these are offerings on the altar. Two lambs for the first year, day by day, continually. Go ahead. The one lamb thou shalt offer in the morning, and the other lamb thou shalt offer at even. So you had a morning oblation and an evening oblation. Go ahead. And with the one lamb, a tenth deal of flour mingled with the fourth part of a hen of beaten oil, and the fourth part of a hen of wine for a drink offer. So when you offer this lamb, guess what? You gotta have some tenth deal of flour. A tenth. It's gotta be a tenth. No more and no less. I'm telling you, the Lord is precise. Go ahead. And the other lamb thou shalt offer at even, and shalt do thereto according to the meat offering of the morning, and according to the drink offering thereof, for a sweet savor, an offering made by fire unto the Lord. This shall be a continual burnt offering throughout your generations at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord, where I will meet you to speak there unto you unto thee. So now you see the Lord is beside you. know That's why. I noticed one day when I was going to Sunday church, they started right on time. Exactly. Yep. They started right on time. They even started their Sunday school on time. And then I noticed things when I got into the truth and started dealing with Israel. Guess what? Whenever. They started whenever. Whenever I show up, we start. That was some of the mentality I saw. It's been, uh, you know, over the years, it's gotten a little better. When I was at the years with God, who he always started on time. And he was mad when everybody else wasn't ready. Because he's like, if I can come here and be ready to start, y'all better be ready to start too. And I guess that's why I get my uh, seal from, because I like to start on time. What's wrong with starting on time? Nothing. <laughs> Still trying to get it live, they can stop getting so long wet. <laughs> we be having to wait. Just out in LA, we be going almost an hour over. But we still start. We do something. We just can't be having people mingling around. Otherwise, you know, people 
want to know. People come in on the new, how come they ain't start? Y'all said one o'clock. We ain't start. So that's a bad example. Wasn't like that in Sunday church, so why should it be like that when we are in the truth, serving the truth and living God? He's always on time. Where we at now? 43. Keep reading. And there I will meet with the children of Israel, and the tabernacle shall be sanctified by my glory. And I will sanctify the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar. I will sanctify also both Aaron and his sons to minister to me in the priest's office. And I will dwell among the children of Israel and will be their God. So what if everything ain't in order? You think the Lord is going to be here? I don't think so. Read some more. And they shall know that I am the Lord their God that brought them forth out of the land of Egypt that I may dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. Okay, Exodus 31. Now he gave all of the instructions, laid out the blueprint. We didn't read it all, but you can read it all on your own. Started way in chapter 25. So now he just laid out the blueprint. Now it's time for somebody to go ahead. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and in understanding and in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship. To, to devise cunning works, to work in gold and in silver and in brass, and in cutting of stone to set them, and in carving of timber to work in all manner of workmanship. So now the Lord told Moses, look, get back down on the mountain. I can call these two cats. I can fill them with the Spirit of God and wisdom, knowledge, and understanding in all manner of workmanship. These dudes, they, can, they got cunning works in gold and silver and in brass, they can cut stones to set them. Who else? Verse 6. And I, behold, I have given with him Aholiath, the son of Ahissamach, of the tribe of Dan. And in the hearts of all that are wise-hearted, I have put wisdom, that they may make all that I have commanded thee. So now the Lord is telling Moses, look, these cats are going to do the work. Well, they're going to be the general foreman. You got some foreman's. Now, the material. Go ahead. The tabernacle of the congregation, and the ark of the testimony, and the mercy seat that is thereupon, and all the furniture of the tabernacle, and the table and his furniture, and the pure candlestick with all his furniture, and all and the altar of incense, and the altar of burnt offering with all his furniture, and the lap laver and his foot, and the clothes of service, and the holy garments for Aaron the priest, and the garments of his sons to minister in the priest's office and the anointing oil, and, and sweet incense for the holy place, according to all that I have commanded thee, shall they do. Okay, skip over to 35. Exodus 35. Pick it up at verse 4. Now it's time to get the material. We got the blueprint. Let's get the material. Go ahead. And Moses spake unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, This is the thing which the Lord commanded, saying, Take ye from among you an offering unto the Lord. Whosoever is of a willing heart, let him bring it, an offering of the Lord, gold and silver and brass. Well, now, he said, Take from among the children of Israel who has the willing heart. In other words, who wants to contribute to building all these things that are for the priests, for the tabernacle, Somebody got to contribute. Somebody got to do the work. Go ahead. And blue, and purple, and scarlet, and fine linen, and goat's hair, and ram skins dyed red, and badger skins, and shittim wood, and oil for the light, and spices for anointing oil, and for sweet incense, and ox stones, and stones to be set for the ephah, and for the breastplate. So we need all this material, laying it out. Verse 10, go ahead. And every wise hearted among you shall come and make all that the Lord hath commanded. And everybody with a wise mind, you're going to come and do what? Y'all going to make this stuff. Somebody got to do it. Somebody got to keep this place clean. Amen. When it get dirty, somebody got to mop the floor. Somebody got to do it. Go ahead. The tabernacle, his tents, and his covering, his tops, 
and his boards, his bars, his pillars, and his sockets, the ark, and the staves thereof, with the mercy seat, and the veil of the covering, the table, and his staves, and all his vessels, and the showbread, the candlestick also for the light, and his furniture, and his lamps, with the oil for the light. Okay, let's get down to 20. And all the congregation of the children of Israel departed from the presence of Moses. And now Moses made the command, this is what I need, y'all. So what did they do? All the congregation of Israel, they departed from the presence of Moses, and they went back and they got the stuff. Go ahead, 21. And they came, every one whose heart stirred him up, and every one whom the Spirit made willing, and they brought the Lord's offering to the work of the tabernacle of the congregation. So whose offering was this? It was for the Lord. Whose place is this? This is for the Lord. Keep reading. And for all his servants, and for the holy garments. And they came, both men and women, as many as were willing hearted. Both men and women. This was an all hands participation. All those that were willing hearted. You know the ones that want to do it. You can tell by the action. We've had brothers come through, they wanted to read, and I'm like, you gotta get in the water, man. I can't put you up there yet. You know? And I know they want to read. They got a lot of zeal. They want to read, but I, I can't do it now. They'll be out of order. Right. I gotta make sure you're committed to the God of Israel before I can put you in the rotation. And how does that commitment take place? You get in that water, get baptized. Brothers know as soon as they get in that water, and you're between 30 and 50 or 20 and 50, I'm putting you up there reading. You got some young brothers, 19. We have that baptism she had. <laughs> but anyway, go ahead. And they came, both men and women, as many as were willing hearted, and brought bracelets and earrings, and rings, and tablets, all jewels of gold. And every man that offered offered an offering of gold unto the Lord. And every man with whom was found blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen and goat's hair and red skins of rams and badger skins brought them. Everyone that did offer an offering of silver and brass brought the Lord's offering. And every man with whom was found shittim wood for any work of the service brought them. And all the women that were wise hearted did spend with their hands. So we got some women who was wise minded too. Women with some wisdom. Did some work for the Lord too. Go ahead. And brought that wick they had spun, both of blue and of purple, and of scarlet and of fine linen. And all the women whose hearts stirred them up in wisdom spun goat's hair. And the rulers brought onk stones, and stones to be set for the ephah and for the breastplate, and spice, and oil for the light, and for the anointing oil, and for the sweet incense. The children of Israel brought a willing offering unto the Lord. Every man and woman whose heart made them willing to bring for all manner of work, which the Lord had commanded to be made by the hand of Moses. So the children of Israel brought a willing offering unto, unto the Lord. Every man and woman whose heart made them willing to bring all manner of work. Let's go to um, verse 10. That's why when you get a place, praise the Lord. Keep it in order. We got the place in LA, Elijah set up some rules. Israel don't like to follow. But if you're in a position, teacher or reader, then you need to set the exam. Follow the rules that you know that was set up. I don't even want to get into that. This day, I still can't get into that. But hey, somebody got to sit me down. If only one person can do it, everybody can see the way you're doing it. First Timothy 5 and 1. That's all I ask. You know, set an example. 5 and 1, read Rebuke not an elder, but they treat him as a father, and the younger men as brothers. So don't be arguing with the elders. You, know? you got to treat them as a father. Treat the younger brothers as brothers. You know? We got our brothers. We got some elders here. I'm, you know, I'm old. I think I'm old. I'm crazy. They don't think you're old in age. But age. You know? Rebuke not an elder. Don't be arguing with an elder. I'm trying to give you some sound advice. What do 
talking about the old women too. Go ahead. The elder woman as mothers, the younger as sisters with all purity. The elder women as mothers. Speaking of mothers, was mom around? She all right? Yeah, she's okay. <laughs> elder women as sisters. Go ahead. What else? Honor widows that are widows indeed. Honor widows that are widows indeed. Go ahead. But if any widow have children or nephews, let them learn first to show piety at home and to requite their parents. For that is good and acceptable before God. So it all starts in the home. Remember what we read? Let them show piety at home. Go ahead. Now she that is a widow indeed, and desolate, trusteth in God, and continueth in supplications and prayers night and day. So if she's a widow indeed, guess what? Trust in God. And continues in supplications and prayers day and night. Skip down to verse 17 and read that. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. So let the elders that rule well be counted what? Worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in word and doctrine. It is not easy to put a lesson together about their issue. You have to burn the cattle in both hands. Tell them. Brothers that know this, you know, it has been up here, what? It was not easy. But you have to do it. You have to labor to do this. That's why we are held more accountable in the eyes of the Lord and the regular people because we are teaching people salvation. And if we teach anybody wrong, guess what? It's going to come back on us. If it's not hurting, it's just real hard. I'm telling you, I'm nervous all the time. I still be sweating at my head. It's not easy. Let the elder that rule well be kind of worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. Go to Luke 10. I was happy just sitting out there with y'all. <laughs> the Lord had other plans for me. I could have said no. Now it came to pass, as they went, that he entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. Now this is Martha. She got, she got a sister named Mary. Go ahead. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his words. Now when <laughs> Jesus came around, guess what? Mary was right there at his feet. Listen to what he had to say. Go ahead. But Martha was cumbered about much serving, and came to him and said, Lord, Dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. Every time, you know, Martha should have been right there. Jesus come to town, hey, let's go. But Mary was the only one that went. Martha was, whatever she was doing, was more important to listen to the words of Jesus. Go ahead. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. But one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. So Jesus told her, look, Martha, you always, you know, preoccupied with something other than trying to get these words. With Mary, your sister, hey, she all about the business. Leave her alone, in other words. Mm -hmm. First Chronicles 13. And that's the way we should be, all about the business of the Lord. Had some set up where and there was always opposition against me because they thought I made these rules up, but I didn't. It was set up to where if you clean the class, if you come at 11:30 to teach the kids, 
pass the lessons out. Monitor the sanctuary for any kind of disturbance. That was the rules that Elijah set up. If you didn't, only the ones, you know, it was hard for me to get these women to bring their kids to class and let them know. I mean, it was rough, man. I was, I was going through it because nobody wanted to be there at 11 30. I mean, we did at the hotel. We started the hotel at 11. But now we start at 1. Hey, you still have the same mindset. You know, we got a kids class. We're teaching the kids. It's important for the kids to be taught. Amen. So get on up like you used to. Just be down here at 11 30 and get the kids talk. Well, that went well. I was the only one there. And I fought tooth and nail. Had a brother argue me down. He couldn't make it. I'm like, dude. You got eight kids. You can't make it. You used to make it. Why can't you make it now? God, relax. But let's move on. Nobody wants to follow the rules. Go ahead and read. Oh, first problem. Did I mention that? First Chronicles 13 and 1, read. And David consulted with the captains of thousands and hundreds and with every leader. And David said unto all the congregation of Israel, If it seem good unto you, and that it be of the Lord our God, let us send abroad unto our brethren everywhere that are left in all the land of Israel, and with them also to the priests and Levites, which are in the cities and suburbs, that they may gather themselves unto us. And let us bring again the ark of our God to us. Now they get ready to bring the ark back. Right. Go ahead. For we inquired not at it in the days of Saul. And all the congregation said that they would do so. For the thing that was right in the eyes of all the people. That's right. It was right in the eyes of all the people to bring the ark back. Go ahead. So David gathered all Israel together from Shirhor of Egypt even unto the entering of Hemat to bring the ark of God from kerjath Jerem, And David went up in all Israel to baal that is, to kerjath Jerem, which belonged to Judah, to bring up thence the ark of God, of God the Lord, that dwelleth between the cherubims, whose name is called on it. And they carried the ark of God in a new cart out of the house of Abinadab, and Uzzah and Ohio drave the cart. And David and all Israel played before God with all their might, and with singing, and with harps, and with psalteries, and with timbrels, and with cymbals, and with trumpets. So now they're bringing the arms back, and it's a joyous occasion. Mm -hmm. But guess what? If you ain't doing it how God instructed you to do it, oh, that joy is out the window. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. And when they came unto the threshing floor of Chidon, Uzzah put forth his hand to hold the ark, for the oxen stumbled. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and he smote him because he put his hand to the ark, and there he died before God. So now he was trying to do a righteous act. The ark was about to, the ox hit his rock or whatever. The cart stumbled. The ark was about to fall. He tried to stop it from falling. The Lord killed him on the spot. He wasn't supposed to touch it. Go ahead. And David was displeased because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah. Wherefore, that place is called Perezuza to this day. And David was afraid of God that day, saying, How shall I bring the ark of God home to me? So David brought not the ark home to himself to the city of David, but carried it aside into the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite. And the ark of God remained with the family of Obed-Edom in his house three months. And the Lord blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that he had. So now David was scared because, look, now he's trying to think, out, How am I supposed to bring the ark home? Well, just read the book, man. He's going to tell you how to do it. He found out. Chapter 15, verse 1, read. And David made him houses in the city of David, and prepared a place for the ark of God, and pitched for it a tent. Then David said, None ought to carry the ark of God but the Levites. What? That's what's written, right? Go ahead. For them have the Lord chosen to carry the ark of God and to minister unto him forever. 
And David gathered all Israel together to Jerusalem to bring up the ark of the Lord unto his place, which he had prepared for it. And David assembled the children of Aaron and the Levites. Okay, we ain't gonna read all the names. Skip down to verse um, 12. Go ahead. And he said unto them, Ye are the chief of the fathers of the Levites. Sanctify yourselves, both ye and your brethren, that ye may bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel unto the place that I have prepared for it. For because ye did it not at the first, mm -hmm. the Lord our God made a breach upon us, for that we sought him not after the due order. So the priests and the Levites sanctified themselves to bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel. And the children of the Levites bear the ark of God upon their shoulders with the staves thereon, as Moses commanded according to the word of the Lord. So now they thought, because they was bringing the ark back, they was taking care of the Lord's business the right way, but it wasn't. Now they found out how to do it, and guess what? They took care of the business. Let's go to um, Acts 15. Acts 15. Because remember, we're doing this for the Lord. That's the mindset we need to have, no matter what it is. Concerning where we have in our holy gathering, it's all for the Lord. He gave his place to us. Amen. He gave it to us, so it, it is our duty to show our appreciation to the Lord by making sure his place is kept in order. And you can't go wrong with that. I guarantee you can't go wrong with that. You can't go wrong with it. Look at the prime example. Look at what booty got. Yeah. yeah. Right. Amen. Look at Big giant place where he can seat at least three or four thousand people. Built from the ground up. Yeah. I wish I could have been out there. Would have had me a little That's right. He didn't mind, he was getting Jefferson back anyway. Everybody he knew in house that had any kind of, you know, trade skill. Work, put him to work, because he knew he was going to get the ties back. You know? But that's all good. That's all good. Um, Acts 15, pick up in verse 25. Because when you start doing things right, that's right. for the Lord, it comes with a price. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Especially when you deal with Israel. Israel don't want to be dealt with. 15 and 25, read it. seemed good unto us, being assembled with one accord, to send chosen men unto you with, with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men that have hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we look at Barnabas and Paul, as he says, the men that have hazarded their lives for what? The name of Jesus Christ. For the name of the Lord, they have been in all kinds of trouble. All kinds of trouble. We're going to read some of the stuff Paul went through. Go to um, 2 Corinthians 11. Hazard in their lives. I mean, it's a hazard to come drive in for like three hours. He <laughs> was nuts on that highway. <laughs> then you got brothers that's flying, you know, in all different cities. You don't know what's going to happen. Right. But we're doing this for the Lord. We're doing it for the Lord. That's why I tell these brothers, look. I try to make it easy. Because everybody got to come through me to go to Vegas. Mm -hmm. So why go way out to LA to get the van and then come back? Right. I'll get the van and come this way and go back that way. Or if you're coming from LA, it's close. Mm -hmm. So there's no reason why anybody should be late. Amen. No reason. None. If I'm making it easy for you, you don't have to drive and you should not be late. Eat. And that's just the way I feel. If I can be here on time, everybody else can't see. There you go. That's it. You just got to leave early enough. I don't care. I mean, you're driving three hours, well, however long it is, you got to adjust your mindset. Look, okay, I got to get up maybe an hour early. Because it's all for the Lord. But you know. Let's read 11 and 6. Let's see some of the stuff Paul went through. Go ahead. But though I be rude in speech, yet not in knowledge, but we have been 
thoroughly made manifest among you in all things? Have I committed an offense in abasing myself that ye might be exalted because I have preached to you the gospel of God freely? Okay, skip down to verse uh, 21. I speak as concerning reproach, as though we had been weak. Howbeit, whereinsoever any is bold, I speak foolishly. I am bold also. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. So they've been talking about Paul. They, they thought Paul was, um, you know, trying to get a little bit puffed up, but he wasn't. He was telling them, look, the Lord chose me to do this. So I'm going to preach this gospel to y'all. I may be rude sometimes in speech, but sometimes, you know, you got to talk to certain people a certain way. Right. He was like, look, am I, are they Hebrews? I'm a Hebrew too. Are they Israelites? So am I. See they Abraham. Go ahead. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant. In stripes above measure. In prisons more frequent. In debts off. So are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool because I've been in more trouble than they have. You know? I've been in labors. I've worked more abundantly. I've been beat. More than been beaten. I've been in prison more than them. Go ahead. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Of my own people, my own brothers beat me. Thirty-nine times beat me for preaching the word of God. Go ahead. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep. Did Paul give up? No. He continued to set the example. I don't care what y'all do to me. I'm still going to serve the Lord. Go ahead. In journeyings often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brothers, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. So Paul said, look, I've been in perils in the wilderness. Because we read men have hazarded their lives in the name of the Lord. Been in perils in the wilderness, perils in the sea. Been shipwrecked. Been in danger amongst false brothers. Been tired. Paul said he's been tired. Man. That's the worst excuse I hear, hate to hear from people. About forsaking their assembly. Oh, I was tired. Yeah. I'm tired too. <coughs> Call your boss and tell him you're tired. Yeah. I guarantee yeah. you won't have a job. Mm -hmm. You don't feel like going to work because you're tired. Well, Lord, I don't feel like having a holy conversation. You know, I'm tired. I'm going to stay home and keep the Sabbath. I'm the wrong person to tell that. I'll put my foot right on your neck. Because <laughs> the only reason you shouldn't be here is if you're in a hospital, laid up in a hospital bed, or you dead. The only two reasons. Other than that, you should not be forsaken the assembly. I don't care if you work 20 hours a day for six days. You better make sure you up to keep that holy convocation. Go back there and fall asleep. I don't care. Just be here. <laughs> That's the worst excuse. I'm tired. Jesus didn't. When he, what if Jesus was tired? Wow. Well, look, I don't want to get nailed on the cross. I'm tired right now. Maybe we can do it the next night. Uh -uh. <laughs> <laughs> some of the excuses. I'm telling you, some of the excuses I hear, and it makes no sense. Because that's the first thing that goes out the window is the Sabbath. You can give your boss 40 hours, yeah. but you can't get it lower 20 bucks. Yeah. You can give your boss 60 hours a week, but you can't get it lower than 20 bucks. Mm -hmm. That don't That's make no sense. But Israel do that. What else? Read that. After going through all that, what else you got to do? Beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. But besides those things that I've been going through, guess what? I still got to maintain the Lord's business. That's right. Take care of the church. Let's go to um, 1 Peter chapter 5. We're almost done. Let's 
five years ago, it seems like yesterday when I'm talking. It seems like all of it's been Well, I tell the brother to set the example. God said, people are watching. They watch everything you do. First Peter 5, verse 1. Okay, read. The elders which are among you I exhort, who am, who am also an elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. So the elders which are among you, I exhort, feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, Go ahead. Neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. So we, you know, brothers that's up here teaching, they ain't like, yeah, you know, pick up that stuff. You know what I'm saying? We're supposed to be the example, you know. There's ways to talk to people, you know. I found that out a long time ago. You got to use simple sight. It works. Do that. There's ways to talk to Israel. Some you gotta be, you know, you gotta bust them upside the head and then some you know how to talk to them. Neither is being lords over God's hairs, but examples to the flock. Go ahead. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that faded not away. So when the Lord show up, which is Jesus, the chief shepherd, guess what? You're gonna appear, you're gonna have that crown of glory. It's not faded away. Look, verse 5, go ahead. Likewise, ye younger. Submit yourselves unto the elder. And that's amongst the church. It ain't out there in the street because these young folks don't care nothing about the whole people. No, no, no. <laughs> but within the class, it's supposed to be some order. Because if it's not, guess what? I'm going to get you and I'm going to get your parents. But if anybody disrespect me or if my daughter disrespect anybody, then you let me know. Go ahead. Yay. All of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud, and giveth great grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. When the devil, he want everybody that's in the class. One. Verse 9. Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, established, strengthened, settled. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Skip down to 14. Go ahead. Greet ye one another with a kiss of charity. Peace be with you all that are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Now I say, greet everybody with a kiss of charity. I ain't all that kissing, but hey, I shake your hand. You know, the books say greet each other with a holy kiss. That's cool. That's what the books say, but I ain't got to that point yet. <laughs> I shake your hand, hug you, cheek, cheek, whatever it is. <laughs> You're supposed to greet each other. <laughs> Romans 16. Like I said, especially people that's coming in on a new greet of They used to hijack them in L.A. when you was at the hotel. So they see somebody new. They try to teach them a whole book and out <laughs> on the sidebar. Yeah. I'm like, man, leave those people alone. They tried to do that to me, but they didn't know that we know. I came from Chicago, you know, they didn't know. It. That's what they tried to do to me. But I just looked, you know, I was like, I said, I'm from Chicago, the original guy. Said, oh, oh, okay. But everybody that was on the news, man, they would get them. And they just, you know, overload. Leave them alone. Yeah. But greet them, you know, ask them how'd you hear about us, you know, things like that. The ones that come in with their hair uncovered, of course, they didn't know. 
They didn't know. Leave them alone. They have turned people away back in the beginning, you know. Turned people away as the Israel God because women had had a haircut, but they obviously didn't know. But they would tell them, you, couldn't, you can't come in here unless you cover your head. What? But that's not the way to approach things, you know. Because it's obviously they didn't know. You got to treat them as new. Treat them and greet them. 16 of 1. Let's look at some greetings and salutes. Go ahead. I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church, which is at Sincrea, that you receive her in the Lord as becometh saints, and that ye assist her in whatsoever business she hath need of you. For she hath been a secure of many and of myself also. So greet Phoebe. Go ahead. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus. Priscilla and Aquila, greet them too. Go ahead. Who have for my life laid down their own necks, unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. So Priscilla and Aquila, hey, they didn't put their life on the line for Paul. Man. Go ahead. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Salute my well-beloved Eponidas, who is the first fruits of Achaia unto Christ. Greet Mary, who bestowed much labor on us. Salute Adronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners, who are of note among the apostles who also were in Christ before me. Greet Amplius, my beloved in the Lord. Salute Urbane, our helper in Christ, and Stychus, my beloved. Salute Apelles, approved in Christ. Salute them which are of Aristobulus' household. Salute Herodian, my kinsman. Greet them that be of the household of Narcissus, which are in the Lord. So these are, you know, fellow brothers, you know, people of the household of faith. Greet them. Right. We always greet everybody in here, right? Mm -hmm. Come in, whatever we do. Greet. A lot of love in here. It's supposed to be. Right. Greet the new people. Show them that same love. Verse 16, read. Salute one another with an holy kiss. The churches of Christ salute you. Salute one another with a holy kiss again. Some people do it. Like I said, I ain't got to that point yet. Go to um, Exodus 36. I got a couple more places that we got. Here. Exodus 36. That's how you set the example, you know? Greet everybody. Thirty-six and one. Read. Then wrought Bezaleel and a Aholiad, and every wise-hearted man, in whom the Lord put wisdom and understanding to know how to work all manner of work for the service of the sanctuary, according to all that the Lord had commanded. I don't know how that got out of order. That should have been after thirty-five. But we're gonna read it anyway. Go ahead. And Moses called Bezaleel and a Aholiad, <laughs> and every wise-hearted man in whose heart the Lord had put wisdom, even every one whose heart stirred him up to come unto the work to do it. And they received of Moses all the offering, which the children of Israel had brought for the work of the service of the sanctuary, to make it withal. And they brought yet unto him free offerings every morning. And all the wise men that brought all the work of the sanctuary came every man from his work which they made. And they spake unto Moses, saying, The people bring much more than enough for the service of the work which the Lord commanded to make. But you see what's happening? The people brought, they only asked for the minimum, but guess what? They brought more. Mm -hmm. right. More and more and more. That's why you have people who want to do more and more for the Lord, even around the sanctuary, you know? You got this one brother back here. I hate to see the brother being used because they be used because he want to do so much for the class. Mm -hmm. And they use them. Yep, yep. They use, yep. I'm like, man, I tell them, look, no, don't worry about that, dude. Don't, you know, don't, don't worry about that. They'll take care of it. Then they come right behind me. My next thing I know, you over there doing something for them. But they will use you because they see you are willing, participant, you want to do, but you're doing this for the Lord. And they will take advantage of you. It's really something else. I'm telling you. <laughs> but go ahead. Verse 6, And Moses gave commandment, and they caused it to be proclaimed throughout the camp, saying, Let neither man nor woman make any more work for the offering of the sanctuary. So the people were 
restrained from bringing. So the people wanted to do more and more and more, but Moses had to say, look, that's enough, y'all. That's enough. You got more than what we need? Just be cool. Verse 7. For the stuff they had was sufficient for all the work to make it, and too much. Too much. 1 Corinthians 14. himself alone and not in another. Well, let everybody prove their own work. And how do you prove that? You set the example. Right. And he shall have rejoicing in himself. You know, man, I'm happy I did that because I did this for the Lord. No matter what anybody else think about you. If you're doing it for God, then you're all right with the Lord. Because the Bible says study to show yourself approved unto God. Not to man. To God. Go ahead. For every man shall bear his own burden. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Go ahead. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Mm -hmm. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Skip down to verse 9 and read. And let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. So let us not be tired of doing what's right. I don't mind being tired of doing what's right. Let us not be tired of doing what's right. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. So let us continue to do what's right and don't be tired from it. Because you're going to get your reward, especially if you're doing it for the Lord. Keep reading. As we have, therefore, opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. And I hope you got some understanding, Jesus. Yeah. We welcome you and hope today's lesson increase your knowledge of the Holy Bible. We have question and 